Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the danger of nuclear war and the damage of nuclear war. Our guest is Ivana Nikolic Hughes, who is president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and a senior lecturer in chemistry at Columbia University. Ivana, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David, for having me. I'm really, really thrilled to be here with you. Thanks for coming on. So what's the what's the connection between chemistry and being an anti-nuclear advocate? Often underappreciated is um, the legacy of the nuclear testing era. And this was this took place over decades. And one of the places, there are numerous places around the world that were impacted by nuclear testing. But arguably, you know, even I would even venture to say the in some sense, the most affected uh, were the Marshall Islands. It's where the United States um, first tested nuclear weapons following, of course, what took place in the summer of 1945. So that involved one test um, in New Mexico, uh, followed by two attacks in Japan. Um, and then it was actually within less than a year uh, of the attacks in Japan that the United States started testing nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands, ultimately spending 12 years uh, testing the equivalent of 7,000 Hiroshima bombs. That's more than one and a half Hiroshima bomb every single day for over 12 years. Um, and it, it just left a devastating legacy that is with the Marshallese people um, till today. And so that's where this, my science background came in, um, in terms of trying to understand what the radiological conditions are like today in the Marshall Islands and, and whether those areas are, you know, decades later is safe for people to live in. So people are still trying to understand the damage done by nuclear bombs decades ago while increasingly talking about using them and, and using words like tactical and limited. Uh, and then in the fine print, it says these, these small tactical bombs are such and such many times larger than the bomb used in Hiroshima or, or the bomb used in Nagasaki. So help, help me to understand what, what is meant by tactical and limited. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, so tactical refers to smaller yield. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki, just to give you a sense, those bombs were uh, 15 kilotons and 21 kilotons respectively. What do we mean when we say kilotons? What we actually mean is the equivalent amount of TNT or chemical explosive that you would need to produce the same amount of energy. And so for example, um, and I'm sure you'll recall the Oklahoma City bombing um, involved two and a half tons of TNT. So that was that was enough um, to destroy a federal building, to kill on the order of 400 people, including children, to destroy buildings in a 16 um, uh, block radius, um, as well as cars, you know, tremendous mon financial monetary damage. That was two and a half tons of TNT. Hiroshima was 15 kilotons, so 15,000 tons equivalent of TNT, so 6,000 times more powerful than the Oklahoma City bomb. So it makes sense. It flattened the city. It didn't just flatten an area. It flattened the city. It killed on the order of 100,000 people. What happened um, in the early 1950s, by the early 1950s, the United States was producing not just atomic bombs, which uh, work on the process of fission. So atomic nuclei, right? So we have atoms, they have nuclei, a nucleus in the center uh, with electrons all around. And if that nucleus splits into two new atoms, new elements, that 
process can release energy. So that's uh, fission, and that was done with the early bombs. By the 1950s, we were producing bombs that use a different um, physical process. It's actually the physical process that gives us energy from the sun. And that's the process of hydrogen atoms fusing or coming together and releasing energy that way. And that um, just that change ended up resulting in bombs that are thousands of times they could have even gone more than that but but thousands of times more powerful than the atomic weapons that were developed early and so what they're mostly referring to with tactical versus strategic weapons is they're mostly referring to two things one is the energy yield right and tactical tend to have even higher than than hiroshima but you know on the order of, of, of those early bombs, whereas strategic have these much higher yields. We used to test in the Marshall Islands, we the United States tested a bomb that was a thousand times more powerful than, than uh, the Hiroshima bomb. The Soviets tested something that was um, 50 megatons, so more than 3000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. But it's mostly refer. It's also referring not just to the yield. It's also referring to um, the range. So how far you know? Uh, uh, so so tactical just means you would it would be kind of um, released from nearby. Um, it, this is just unthinkable, right? The fact that we're even talking about these bombs being used today is absolutely unacceptable. And here are just some of the reasons. One, of course, we know that that even, even limited would be horrible and so on. But the scariest part really is the fact that the uh, that all simulations seem to suggest that you use one, the next thing you you have is nuclear war. And if we have nuclear war, I mean, I'll just, the summary sentence is human civilization as we know it is over and, and potentially humanity, potentially all of life on the, on the planet. So to talk about using a tactical nuclear weapon, like it's just some little event that would happen um, is, is really unfathomable. Um, one point I'll make is even if we somehow had the decency and the and and reason and wisdom to stop at that one tactical nuclear warhead being used. My concern is that um, you know within years you you would end up in that nuclear war scenario because you'd break the taboo. At least what we have the the you know the one thing we can now say is we have a taboo of nuclear weapons use. And if that's broken, you know, to me that that just whether it's immediate or even a little delayed, that's just you know the the end of the yeah. world. Anyway, even not uh, helpful, e not, even not uh, helpful. Nicola Hughes, let me let me run a, a a different argument by you that strikes me as absolutely insane, and I think you might be inclined to agree. I I read this recently from a, a Russian government official uh, who advocates using one bomb as a means of deterrence. So this is sort of, I've always thought the deterrence argument was a little bit insane and was more of a risk than a safety measure, but this takes it to the extreme where the means of deterrence is actually use. And the argument is that if you use one bomb, everyone will suddenly come to their senses, suddenly oppose mass murder, uh, and no one will ever use another bomb again. What do, what do you make of this uh, argument? I, I think that's really crazy. I mean, I, I agree with you that deterrence in the traditional way that it is described is, is really, in some sense, absolute nonsense. Um, and I can, I can talk about why, for example, people say, well, we haven't had you know, nuclear weapons use. And there's a whole line of thinking that actually we do use them all the time. We use them the way you know, Daniel Ellsberg was very fond of saying this. We use them the way 
um, a robber uses a gun uh, when they point it at your head, they don't have to pull the trigger to be using it. So, you know, we've, we have been using nuclear weapons all these decades. Um, but the, uh, I, I, I mean, this, the, that new twist um, is, is really a, a step too far. And I think, um, uh, I, I think that the work on kind of trying to understand nuclear war and, and simulate it and so on suggests that that's just not at all how it would play out. Um, and um, one, since I mentioned Daniel Ellsberg, I actually have it here. Uh, so I'm just gonna read, you know, and, and it kind of has to do with this notion of deterrence and how we talk about nuclear policy. And, and here's Daniel Ellsberg in his book, The Doomsday Machine. What is missing, what is foregone in the typical discussion and analysis of historical or current nuclear policies is the recognition that what is being discussed is dizzyingly insane and immoral in its almost incalculable and inconceivable destructiveness and deliberate murderousness, its dispro disproportionality of risked and planned destructiveness to either declared or unacknowledged objectives, the invisibility of its secretly pursued aims, like to damage limitation to the United States and allies or to achieve victory in a two-sided nuclear war, its criminality to a degree that explodes ordinary visions of law, justice, crime, its lack of wisdom and compassion, its sinfulness and evil. I mean, this is just, to me, you know, this is this this may as well be the definition of nuclear deterrence that you have these policies that can not only kill millions of people indiscriminately, uh, but also can lead. And this is yet another, you know, area where where scientific work has really made um, all of this so much clearer uh, to us where we have a concept called nuclear winter, where nuclear war doesn't just mean flat cities and millions of, of people dying um, either immediately or from impacts of radiation. It also means climate changes that are such that the entire globe, essentially um, temperatures go down by 10 to 15 degrees Celsius which is a lot. The average temperature on Earth currently is 15 degrees Celsius. And so if we go down by 10 or 15 degrees Celsius, that means essentially everything is frozen. This also means that, uh, or on average, sorry, on average, the, the Earth is essentially frozen. And this also means that food production goes down significantly and that in fact, billions of people die. So this isn't just about, oh, Moscow and New York are gonna be flattened and, and Washington and whatever. This is about the entire world um, essentially, you know, uh, being um, just uh, just end of human civilization as we know it. No, no, no other way really to describe it. Uh, very, very well said, Ivana Nikolic, Hughes, a, a, and very well said by the late, great Dan Ellsberg, who we lost last month. Um, but what it, it's my impression, tell me if I'm wrong, that most people have no concept whatsoever of nuclear winter. It's not taught in schools. People imagine that a nuclear war can happen somewhere and not happen somewhere else. Uh, what does it say about our communication system that we can't tell anyone this seemingly most important fact ever in existence uh, and that people would be proposing to use a nuclear weapon in order to communicate what it does as if we can't tell people what it would do. Are we, are we this incapable of, of communicating to each other? Uh, there is something there that just isn't isn't clicking i mean there's something about our media currently that this isn't at the top of every you know this I, the the latest study so i'll give you i'll give you some numbers 
The latest study that came out last August, and I should just say Alan Robach from Rutgers and Lily Gia, and um, there have been others over, over time who were involved, Brian Toon, um, et cetera. These people have really been working on this in some sense for decades. So the idea of nu nuclear winter first came up in the early 1980s. And um, it, in many ways, I, I think also helped to kind of reinvigorate that the movement, the anti-nuclear movement in the 1980s, right? Um, and uh, the idea was that at that time, scientists had found out, had really learned and figured out what happened to the dinosaurs. So they figured out that an asteroid hit the earth, right? And that it caused um, both immediate, you know, widespread fires and so on, but that then the climate change and, and food production um, uh, went down and, and all of these large uh, uh, species of dinosaurs essentially um, went extinct. What people realized at that time is they wondered, obviously if another asteroid hit the earth, the same thing could happen, but they wondered whether there are any other conditions that were any other causes, right, that could lead to the same conditions on the planet, and then realized that actually, if you had nuclear war, and you had widespread fires from cities, that would release soot into the atmosphere and block incoming sunlight. And, and there's a key point here to be made, which is we've been dealing with these wild, wildfires coming from Canada. The thing about wildfires is they only make the soot only makes it so high into the atmosphere. So eventually it rains out, right? It eventually comes down. These wildfires from nuclear weapons explosion, the soot would make it all the way into the stratosphere where it would stay for years, right? So it wouldn't just come down, it wouldn't just wash out. So it would stay for, for years blocking incoming sunlight and therefore causing these temperature drops and um, the, uh, the, the, the food production um, crisis, right? And in the 1980s, we didn't quite, we understood the concept, but we didn't quite have the ability to predict very precisely, you know, it was very rough, how much of an impact this would be. Of course, in the ensuing decades, we've had all of this work from um, people working on climate change, right? Uh, models and much better understanding of the atmosphere and all of these things. And so those models have been applied more recently to try and really quantify the impact of nuclear winter. So I'll give you two um, results from, from that recent Gia and Robach and others study, which came out last August. And that is that in a war, nuclear war between India and Pakistan, in which they essentially both used their arsenals, which are on the order of 100 nuclear warheads, 150, they used their arsenals. 127 million people die from the attacks, right? So that seems horrific enough. And over 2 billion die from starvation within um, less than two years uh, uh, because the food availability just goes down so significantly. If the United States, so that's the you know medium scenario, if the United States and Russia were to use one third of their current arsenals over on the order of five and a half billion people die from starvation within two years, 99% of the people in the United States, this is, this is national suicide, right? Engaging in nuclear war, there is no victory. There's no way that you can destroy your opponent, right? In such a way that, that keeps you safe. Even if no Russian bombs ever reach the United States, we would have to use so many that we would starve ourselves to death. It's, it's national suicide and it's planetary homicide. It's just the end, you know, there's no, no victory. As, as Ellsberg said, there's no victory in this. 
even I am I am a little bit confused because you make a very powerful case and you teach at a university, Columbia in New York City. I'm sure that the city of New York listens to uh, the smartest people in New York. But I think it was last year they put out a video suggesting that if New York City were nuked, what you would need to do would be to go indoors and maybe order pizza and you'd, you'd be okay as long as you didn't go outside. And follow much. updates on your phone. You know, they even had like follow updates. I mean, that, that part was the craziest part, right? Because there's not going to be any infrastructure for your cell phone to work for you to get a message from the city go indoors i mean if you were really far away it, it go indoors is not on its own bad advice it's just that that wasn't gonna solve you know any of our problems and in new york city i mean you know depending on there are these simulations that are really just horrifying of you know it lands in Times Square, and what's the radius where everything is just incinerated versus buildings collapsing versus acute radiation exposure, et cetera, et cetera. It's not good. Um, it's just, and, and, and on top of it, the idea that it would keep going, right, that this wouldn't end the way the attacks in Japan were just, those were the only weapons we had. We actually didn't have any more, even though the US was bluffing, like we'll keep bombing you. That was it. That was all they had. This this would not be the end, right? An attack on New York City is not where this would end. Um, and so, so go yeah. indoors is, is actually a teeny bit misleading when the only thing that would lead to your survival would be act now and act so that governments dismantle and disarm and rid the world of nuclear weapons. You're absolutely right. Prevention is the only way. It is the only way. If it happens, in fact, I've heard diplomats say this at the UN and I've said it myself, the best thing is to go towards it, you know, and die sooner rather than later. It's because it's not, it's not going to be good. So yes, you're right. The city, um, as well as our, our, our entire government, this should be, everybody should be up in arms about the threat that these weapons pose to us. And, and, this is David, this is not an argument you're gonna like, but I'm gonna make it anyway, and I don't like it either. Nuclear weapons are essentially the only way that this country with all its military, all its spending, all its bases, all that we're doing, all the horror, not that I agree with any of it, right? But it's the only way, nuclear weapons are the only way that this country could be destroyed by someone else. And not only could it be destroyed by someone like Russia, the United States, as we know, it could be destroyed by North Korea, a relatively small, relatively poor country that has on the order of 40 nuclear warheads today, enough to destroy the United States as we know it. And the fact that we as a country, that our government isn't doing everything they possibly could to get rid of these nuclear weapons everywhere is insanity. Um, and they, what they have to accept, however, is that they can't just tell North Korea to disarm while we keep our thousands, I haven't even mentioned this, right? We have thousands of nuclear warheads and there are, there are 5,000 nu nuclear warheads. The only way that anyone else is going to disarm if it, is if we lead the world towards disarmament and say, let's all get rid of them. Um, but that would be good for us and for humanity and for all these other things, right? But it would be good for the United States. Well, I think, and we have just uh, three or four minutes left, uh, Ivana Nikolic Hughes, uh, that, that Mikhail Gorbachev, among others, was right in saying that wouldn't do it. For other nations to get rid of nuclear weapons, the United States would have to get rid of some of its non-nuclear weapons and its military sure. bases sure. around the globe and stop trying to dominate the globe through violence because it's not only with nuclear weapons that Completely the States agree. destroy other countries. Completely agree. Completely agree. But in the interim, 
you know, I, I, since we have limited time, I just want to say that there is hope. There is a treaty now. It's an international treaty. It's called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, 60, uh, two countries, uh, sorry, 68 countries have ratified it. 92 countries have signed it. Um, this has to be, you know, pressure from all sides on the countries that have nuclear weapons. So it has to be international pressure. There has to be domestic pressure from the inside. We have to get rid of these weapons. They've caused tremendous harm in the past. They continue actually to harm people. Places like the Marshall Islands remain contaminated um, and, and people there continue to suffer because of what took place there. And then our future is just, it, it doesn't exist as long as these, these weapons are around. I want my kids to have a future. And so um, for that to really happen, we have to get rid of nuclear weapons. With just about two minutes left, uh, impossible question, but what can we try that we haven't tried yet? How can we move the world in that direction? And how can people get involved with your work and follow what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So look us up, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Uh, the website is wagingpeace.org. We're obviously on all, all the different platforms and social media. We are we we have to educate and we have to advocate and we have to do it in all kinds of places. I go from high schools to colleges to writing op-eds to giving interviews. People need to know this. And unless they know it, they can't, you know. Uh, do anything about it. Uh, so I do think that the widespread um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, widespread um, information is is really key. Our mass media just don't like the topic. They just they they don't want to um, write about this. There was very limited coverage of the nuclear winter stuff. Um, it's uh, you know. Uh, I have all kinds of reasons why I think that's true, right? Why they're not writing about this, but the least cynical perhaps is that it's, you know, it's not fun to tell people we're all gonna die in nuclear winter uh, and the human civilization will be over. Um, that's the least cynical one, <laughs> but well, people need to know because then they can help make, make, make changes and support the treaty. There's national legislation to support the treaty. Um, we have to have um, both education and advocacy. Yeah, it, it may be difficult also to tell people there's no individual consumer solution, whether going indoors or something more difficult, but that we have right. to take mass action together, which I haven't seen a newspaper in the United States recommend as a solution to anything ever. Um, so agreed, agreed. We've, agreed. we've got work to do. Uh, please. We, do. we absolutely do. <laughs> Please follow the, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. We've been speaking with Ivana Nikolic Hughes, who is the, the new president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and a senior lecturer uh, in chemistry at Columbia University. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.